basically. <laughs> so uh, hello, good morning everyone. So uh, this will be uh, uh, also about um, hair cells and mechanosensation by hair cells in the inner ear. Uh, Jim just told us that hair cells are mechanically active. And what I want to do here is to give you a bit more detail about the mechanism that uh, might explain the emergence of osmotic oscillations in this biological system, and then go on and discuss recent results about estimates about how much energy the system may consume to sustain these oscillations and um, respond with high sensitivity and, and sharp frequency selectivity to stand stimulus. Stimuli. And this, this is work done in collaboration with our host, Edgar Holden, and uh, Juan Parondo is in the room somewhere here. Um, so let's start. So um, this is a hair cell, in case you forgot. And hair cells are called hair cells because they, they equipped with a beautiful hair bundle that produced from the apical surface. And this hair bundle, composed of a few tens of single protrusions, works as a sort of mechanical antenna. Hearing starts with the deflection of the hair bundle, which modulates tension in oblique tip links connecting the top of each stereocilium to the flank of the nearest taller neighbor. A positive deflection, that is a deflection directed towards the taller rows, increases tension in the tip links, which pull open ion channels, giving rise to an increase in flux of cations, mainly potassium ions, but also calcium ions, which will play a major role in the following. The relation between the transduction current and the deflection of the bundle, noted delta x here, is sigmoidal in shape. For large negative deflection, where the tension in the tip links is low, the channels are closed. As one moves the bundle towards the positive direction, tension in the tip links increases, which opens the iron channel until tension is large enough to maintain the channels in an open state. Now, the way we think about mechanical sensitivity about, uh, in, in, this, in, this, uh, in these hair cells is greatly influenced by um, a so-called getting spring model that was introduced by uh, David Corey and Jim Hatzbeth, and it will be 40 years ago th this year. So happy birthday, Jim. <laughs> so within this framework, channels are gated directly by mechanical force that is transmitted through the channel via an elastic spring called the getting spring. At thermal equilibrium, the open probability of the channel is set by the energy difference between the open and the closed state of this system, and it happens to vary this energy linearly with the extension of the spring. It varies linearly in proportion to a fundamental parameter called Z here, which is termed getting force. The getting force, Z, is a product of the getting swing stiffness by the size of the getting swing, D. The getting, swing, uh, the, the getting force is important because it sets the width of the sigmoidal relation between open probability and position, as well as the slope of the sigmoid. The larger the gaining force, the steeper the sigmoid, and therefore the larger the response will be to a given deflection of the bundle. Another property that must be tightly regulated is the operating point of the transducer. The operating point of the transducer lies in the steep region of sigmoid, which makes sense because this is where the response to weak vibration, weak deflections, will give rise to the maximal response. Because channels are more stable in a closed state, that is when there's no tension in the tip links, they're closed, there must be some tension even in the absence of sound in the tip links to maintain them in this operating point. This tension is thought to be mediated by active force production by Mars in motors that are located on the top hand of the link and are walking upward along actin uh, filaments towards the tip of stereocilia. When they reach stall condition, the force that the motors produce upward uh, defines how much tension there is in the link. If the motors were too strong or too weak, the channels would be respectively all open or all closed at rest, and we wouldn't hear very faint sounds. Somehow, biology is so well, so, so, so well regulated that the motors are, quote, quote, adapted to impose an operating point in the steep region of the sigmoid. Calcium plays an important role in regulating the operating point. And this we know from very old recordings from the 80s by the group of David Curry here, showing that as the calcium concentration is increasing the bar from here at the top left, 250 micromolar up to 10 millimolar at the lower right, the fraction of the ion channels that are open at rest decreases from about here 60% down to 10%. Two models have been pushed forward to explain why channel closed at higher calcium. A first possibility 
is that the margin motors that are pulling on the tip links are calcium sensitive, so that when you increase calcium, the motors get weaker and the channels close. Another type of model postulates that calcium instead interacts with the ion channel to stabilize its closed state. If it stabilizes its closed state, then if you increase calcium, the channels will also close. Whatever the detail mechanism, and we are not unsure about the detail mechanism, this uh, active force production by morosin, as well as calcium feedback, results in active hair bubble mechanics. We study active hair bubble mechanics by using hair cells excised from the ear of the frog, which is really the great unsung hero of the field, because of most of what we know about hair cells comes from this guy. We, we, we extract from the ear of the frog a flat tissue called the sacculus, and we have here an electron micrograph of this tissue, which is about one millimeter across, and you see here in the center, the sensory part of the tissue, where about 2,000 to 3,000 hair cells reside, and you see a forest of hair bubble pointing in the surrounding fluid. On the left here is a nerve fiber, you know, the, the, nerve, the nerve, that will innervate the hair cells from underneath. I'll show you here a closer view of the forest of bundles, and if you move even closer, you see now the typical pictures that Jim showed you with a nice arrangement of very regularly organized uh, hair bundles. So the hair bundles we've heard are not just mechanical antennas, they're also actively motile, and this we can demonstrate by uh, observing that they can show uh, noisy spontaneous oscillations. You have here a movie showing two hair bundles in from the top, and as you can appreciate, they shake back and forth from left to right. Now, at the turn of the last century, Jim and I wondered how we could actually rigorously demonstrate that these fluctuating movements result from an active process. And then we realized that the answer might, we might, might get some help from you know, statistical physics, which tells us that at thermal equilibrium, there must be a relation between spontaneous fluctuations of a system and its linear response. And this relation is called the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Now, the hair bundle is ideal to test whether or not this relation is satisfied because it's relatively simple, although there are only a few groups in the world that do it, to measure the fluctuations of, the, of, this, of these organelles as well as their linear response. So here's a recording of spontaneous oscillations of a hair bundle on the top, x of t, and at the bottom, you see the power spectral density of that movement, and you can appreciate that there's a peak, so there's a real oscillation, and we can define with a peak a characteristic frequency of the movement which ranges between 5 and 50 hertz. You can also appreciate that these oscillations are rather noisy because if one computes the ratio of the peak frequency with the width of half the maximal height, we get a quality factor that is between 1 and 2, meaning that the, these movements lose phase coherence after a couple cycle of oscillation. As Jim told us, we can measure response by attaching flexible glass fibers to the top of the bundle and by controlling the position of the base, at the base of the fiber. I'll show you again this recording uh, 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 showing the response of a noisy, uh, 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 noisily oscillating hair bundle to an oscillatory movement at the base of the fiber here at 9 hertz. From such recording, we can measure a frequency-dependent response function, which is defined as the ratio of the Fourier component of the response at the frequency omega s here of the force and the Fourier component of the force. The response function here is a complex number that has a real and imaginary part that will depend on the frequency of the stimulus. Here's a plot of the real part psi prime and the imaginary part psi double prime as a function of frequency. For the sake of time, we will discuss the imaginary part of the response function only because this, this is the part that amounts to how much work is provided by the fiber. In the case of a controlled hair bundle that is stable, that is, that does not oscillate, we see that the, the, the chi double prime, the dissipative part of response function, is positive at all frequencies and increases with frequency. This is expected from a passive system because positive chi double prime here means that the fiber is injecting energy into the bundle to move it at a specific frequency. In other words, we are driving the bundle. In contrast, as you can appreciate, an oscillatory hair bundle has, uh, shows a different behavior. This bundle oscillated at 8 hertz. When we try to move it faster than its natural frequency, the dissipative part of the response function is positive, meaning we have to inject energy into the bundle to make it go faster. However, if we try to slow it down, then it's the opposite. It's the bundle driving the fiber. We're sucking energy out 
out of the bundle and there's energy pumping by the bundle into the fiber. Obviously, the system is active. We can then probe whether the fluctuation dissipation theorem is uh, satisfied or not. The fluctuation dissipation theorem relates the spectral density of spontaneous movement C tilde to psi double prime. And if it's satisfied, this ratio here must be equal to 1. Equivalently, this means that this effective temperature that is defined by the ratio here must be equal to the actual temperature T. In the case of a control bundle that does not oscillate, we see that the fluctuation dissipation is satisfied, which came actually as kind of a surprise because the cell is still living, it's still alive. But we do, do not see any signature in the movement, in the fluctuations of the movement of activity. In contrast, for the oscillatory hair bundle, we see that a striking uh, you know, divergence of the effective temperature near the natural frequency of, uh, of oscillation and a change in sign. This is because, as I told you, as I showed you, the chi double prime is changing sign at the frequency of oscillation. Now, violation of fluctuation dissipation theorem uh, clearly demonstrates that both the spontaneous movement as well as the linear response to oscillatory stimuli in this system result from an active process. However, the, the theorem doesn't tell us how much energy the system has to spend to sustain these active movements. As you know, because you're here, there has been over the past 10 years a lot of activity in the field of stochastic thermodynamics to estimate entropy production by uh, active, uh, 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 active systems. In particular, uh, Edgar Rolden and Juan Parondo have developed an approach uh, uh, over the past 10 years that, that attempts to quantify uh, entropy production from uh, time irreversibility of trajectories in phase space. Juan will give a talk about the uh, theoretical underpinning of the method. I'm an experimentalist. I will just describe here how we apply the method to estimate energy production by hair bundles here. So I show you here a trajectory like the position of a bundle as a function of time. And as you can see, if we time reverse the trajectory, they are clearly different. Already, but just by looking at this trajectory, we can tell that the system is out of equilibrium. In some other trajectories, the answer is not so obvious. As you can see here, it looks like a square wave. And when we time reverse, it's not so clear that uh, 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 we've changed something. What Edgar and, uh, and, and Juan told me is that you can estimate the rate of entropy production by measuring the, uh, uh, the cooled by libel divergence between the probability density to observe the forward trajectory and the probability density to observe, observe its uh, time reversed. For those of you like me, not so long ago, that didn't know anything about cooled by libel divergence, I recall that for, uh, uh, if you have two distributions of a single variable x, the cooled by libel divergence is simply the mean of a distribution p of the log ratio of p by q. OK. Now, if we had access to all out of equilibrium degrees of freedom, we could get a tight bound to entropy production. However, as is often the case in the biological systems, we have very limited information about the system. In particular here, we only measure one degree of freedom, which is the position of the bundle as a function of time. Because the system oscillates, we already know there must be some hidden variable additional that drives the system. So we have only limited information. For that reason, we can expect only a lower bound to entropy production. Now, if we want to use this formula to estimate uh, how much there is, there's also a difficulty in that uh, we don't have access to all possible trajectories that the Hubble might explore. So therefore, it's impossible to uh, assay what's the probability to observe a given one. However, Edgar came up with a nice solution to that problem, which relies on the invariance of the cool by label divergence with one-to-one -one transformation, or a trench of the variable that corresponds to one-to-one -one transformations. The one-to-one -one map that we used transformed the original variables x and its time reverse into white noise. This is done, um, uh, and the new variables will be called xi. This is done by, I won't give too much details, but this is done by using an autoregressive model to subtract to each position, measured position at time i, a forecast uh, given by the 10 preceding positions. When we do so, we can get rid of, uh, of correlations into the signals, as demonstrated here on the right, that we, you have the autocorrelation of the signals. So before transformation, you see this nice oscillation. And as I told you, it dampens over about two cycles. After transformation, the residuals, xi uh, uh, r and xi f, 
are flat, and we have um, uh, now uh, stochastic variables that are uh, independent and identically distributed with distributions P and Q respectively. Now it's relatively easy to uh, estimate the Kullback libel divergence because these distributions P and Q we can get from just computing histograms of the fluctuations of the residuals. So what do we get? We apply the method to a library of 182 oscillatory hair bundles and uh, computed the estimate of entropy production rate, sigma 1, in kb per second, and you have here the distribution. Entropy production rate here could go up to 10 or 20 kb per second, but was on average about 3 kb per second. For a cell oscillating at 10 hertz, this corresponds to about 0.3 kbt per cycle. The good news is that the method is able to tell just by quantifying time irreversibility whether these fluctuations are active or not. The bad news is the, 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 the lower bounds we get are really, really low. <laughs> and this we can estimate. I'm an experimentalist, so I just do back of the envelope calculations. We can just estimate just by computing, you know, if you move a sphere in water at a frequency of 10 hertz, uh, an amplitude of 20 nanometer, a sphere with the size of a hair bundle, how much dissipation we expect, then you find something like 30 kbt per cycle, which is two orders, already two orders of magnitude larger than the estimates we get. So from experimentalist perspective, you know, the method is a bit deceptive in a way. So the rest of the talk will be about, uh, you know, trying to discuss how we can be, could be better and try to get better or tighter bounds to entropy production. And for that, I need to discuss a bit more, get more information about the system by discussing a bit more why it oscillates. As Jim has already told us, oscillatory hair bundles are endowed with a peculiar mechanical property, which is that they show negative stiffness. For large deflections of the bundle, either in a negative direction where channels are closed or in a positive direction where channels are open, the force displacement relation of the bundle is linear, so the bundle behaves like a linear spring, Hooke's law is satisfied. However, in a narrow range of displacement in the center here, where the channels switch between their open and closed state, the, 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 the relation inflects, and we, get, we can get a, a, a region of negative stiffness in the center. Now, negative stiffness is intimately re, uh, linked to the mechanism of a mechanosensitivity. If it takes force to open a channel, then as the channel pops open, it will generate a force, uh, uh, an internal force, by virtue of mechanical reciprocity. The force that the opening of a channel generates, we know, is the getting force. It's because as the channel pops open, as Jim demonstrated with the mouse trap, the extension in the spring is decreased, so the tension in the spring is decreased by the amount Z. This decrease in force goes in the same direction as the external force we apply to the spring. Now, as the channels fluctuate within the open and closed state, we can only determine the mean tension in the getting spring. The mean tension in the getting spring is given by this uh, simple formula here, will be given by the linear elasticity of the getting springs, first term, but will be reduced by an amount that corresponds to the mean getting force, the mean effect of channel opening as you bring the system to a position x. As a result, there's a strict correspondence between the sigmoidal relation between open polarity and displacement and mechanics. When the channels are either all closed or all open, this is linear, but in the narrow region where we switch between states, there's a phenomenon of getting compliance. And this term was coined by uh, Jim Haspeth and Joe Howard. They're both in the room. That's quite intimidating. Um, and uh, uh, where you see that the slope is lower. Again, the getting force is key. Because if you increase the getting force, uh, let's see. If you increase the getting force, you steepen up the sigmoid, as we already said. And correspondingly, you get a greater and greater nonlinearity up to a point where negative stiff stiffness emerges. Experimentally, we can fit our measured force displacement relation with this simple formula and get uh, numbers for the linear elasticity of a hair bundle, which is on the order of one piconewton per nanometer, and for uh, the single channel getting for z, which is about a piconewton. Note here that we don't have a piconewton in this vertical shift. We have more than that. We have 40 piconewtons. And it's because in a hair bundle from the frog, there are about 50 ion channels operating in parallel. So we must, must identify the value z by 50. Now, 
All this phenomenology can be explained by uh, equilibrium thermodynamics. There's nothing active in there. You can build up a device like this one by coupling elastic springs to snap doors, you know, something that can uh, snap open. So how come the system then becomes oscillatory? Well, to answer the question, we just have to remember that the getting springs are coupled to molecular motors. The job of the motors is to set tension in the spring as to impose an operating point in the center of the sigmoid. But by symmetry, if, this, if, if, if we go right at the center and we have negative stiffness, because the getting force are large, this operating point will be unstable. If this operating point is unstable, then either we are on the right or either we are on the left. If you're on the right, channels are open, there's a lot of calcium flowing into the cell, which will make the channels reclose. So if the channels are open, they will be closed. If we're on the, uh, if we're on the left, channels are closed, little calcium flows into the cell, channels will be open. This is a hand wavy argument to explain that we get an oscillation around the unstable region of negative stiffness. Now we can be more serious about that and develop a model. And this is the equations that we are using. Uh, they couple two degrees of freedom. The observable x, which is the position of the bundle at the top here, along an horizontal axis, and the unknown, the hidden variable, that corresponds to the position of the motors that are working up and down to regulate tension in the tiplings. At steady state, the tippling tension must be compensated by pivoting of the stereocilia so that their two forces balance. If they don't balance, then the bundle moves at a velocity that will be inversely proportional to its friction coefficient lambda. Note there's no mass term here. It's because as a scale of a bundle, inertia is negligible. The second equation describes how the motors move. The motors are pulling with the force Fm on the tippling, so at steady state, the force is balanced by tippling's tension. If it's not, we assume a linear force-velocity relation, so the motors move at a velocity that will be uh, uh, varying in, in inversely to uh, coefficient lambda a. Now, calcium is important, and we include the effect of calcium by assuming that the motors, the, fo the motor force decreases by an amount s here, calcium feedback strength, when channel pops open. So if the open probability is different than zero, the force is reduced from the maximal value of f max. The only nonlinearity in the system comes from the sigmoidal shape of the relation between open probability and displacement. Now, to discuss a bit more what happens in such a model, we can expand it around a fixed point and look at the linearized version of the model. In that case, we, we, are, we are set with the two, these two linear equations, very simple. The first one is the equation of motion of the bundle. It's overdamped. There's no mass. This is the friction coefficient. This is the stiffness of the bundle around the fixed point. And now we see that motor action results in effective force that's driving the bundle from inside. As the motors move, the, uh, as the bundle moves, the force will change because if the, bu the bundle moves, tension with tiplings will increase or decrease, which will allow the motors to move, so they will react. The, motors, the fo motor force will change, but not immediately. It will change with a time scale, tau, so there's delayed force feedback. Now, because these equations are linear, even I can get rid of the hidden variable to get a single equation of uh, position x and if we do that, then we see that we, the, the dynamics can be mapped into that of an effective harmonic oscillator. Although there's no inertia in the system, the feedback generates inertia. The feedback also modifies friction, more importantly. And you see here, the new friction is the friction we had before, the passive friction, which is always positive, plus this term, k tau. Now we can discuss the effect of the feedback depending on the sign of stiffness. In the case where stiffness is positive, then uh, uh, the feedback will generate an additional positive friction to the bundle. So in fact, with sti positive stiffness, motor force production stabilizes the bundle. However, if getting forces, which is a passive phenomenon, are large enough to provoke, to evoke negative stiffness, then that coupled to motor adaptation results in effective negative friction because this term now, now becomes negative. So with negative stiffness, we reduce damping. If we reduce damping uh, in, a, in an amount that is large enough, then uh, we, we can get resonant because the quality factor can become greater than one. And if the, the feedback precisely cancels out the passive friction, we can even get to a hop affection 
and the stem starts, will start oscillating spontaneously at the frequency given by the square root of the effective stiffness by the effective mass. We believe this is the reason why, in experiments, when we measure sensitivity of a bundle as a function of uh, frequency, we see something that peaks near the natural frequency of, of the oscillatory bundle. This is because of this active phenomenon that gives rise to something equivalent to an active resonance. When the cell does not oscillate, its sensitivity is small and flat because it's determined entirely by its stiffness. Now, calcium, so there's a gain. I, I just show this slide because to, show, to demonstrate that calcium is very important because it defines the, the dynamical state of the system. This is the bundle that did not oscillate at rest, but upon a moderate increase in the calcium concentration, we can trigger oscillations at a bifurcation point that is here. So bifurcations indeed exist in that system. This, this, you know, this demonstrates it. So uh, in the last few minutes, I will now describe um, um, from what we learn how we can discuss now how much power is required by the hair cell to drive its oscillations. So to do that, I just rewrite the same model in a more abstract way. So to, int as to introduce effective forces, F1 and F2, that are now uh, 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 that are conjugate to the two degrees of freedom, x and xa. F1 is a conservative force. It derives from a potential, but F2 is not. It's a sum of a conservative force by uh, the active motor force, which is, doesn't derive from a potential. Now, the system is stochastic. There, are, there is noise in the system, so there are noise terms on the right-hand side. The first noise term obeys fluctuation dissipation theorem. The second does not because... It, is at, it, is, uh, it comes from the stochasticity of motor binding and unbinding to the actin filaments. Now, Edgar tells me that if you have such a system of equations, the total rate of entropy production is simple to compute. It's the sum of entropy production produced by the first equation, which looks like under the Langevin dynamics of a particle in the fluid, and with the, the, the entropy production produced by the second equation. So using this model, we have a way to quantitatively determine how much energy is spent by the system. The question then becomes, for the experience that I am, how could you get a tight bound to that expression? To do that, we run stochastic simulations. Uh, and we see here an oscillation, uh, a, you know, the simulation of the position of the bundle that oscillates over time. And that's the oscillation of the hidden variable, the motor position that also oscillates over time. We have, do not have access to the motor position, however, from the knowledge of the position of the bundle and the position of the motors, we can compute the open probability of the channel, which is proportional to the current that flows into the hair cell, which can, in principle, be measured. If we now plot the open probability of the channel as a function of the position of the bundle, we discover there is a counterclockwise current in this 2D phase space. We can parameterize uh, this current by looking at how the angle phi here in blue processes around the center here over time. It will do one turn, 2 pi, every period of oscillation. The plot on the right here shows that the angle grows approximately linearly with time. The slope of this relation defines the, you know, the average current. But there's some fluctuations. So what Edgar did is measure the angle that the system had reached after two seconds of recordings, 450 recordings. Divide that by two seconds, which gives the current and look at the distribution of that current. So th there's a mean value, and there's some you know, deviations from the mean value. And now what we did is use a very, uh, I found, very beautiful relation that was derived by Udo Seifert and colleagues. I've never met Udo Seifert, so I don't know how he looks like. He must be somewhere in the room. Also, uh, also Jordan, Jordan Horowitz. What? Jordan also was yeah. And. And um, uh, this relation is called the thermodynamic uncertainty relation. And it, uh, it tells us that if we measure both the, the mean current and its variance, by, by computing the ratio of that, we can get a lower bound of entropy production. Using these numbers that we get, we find that uh, from the mean and the variance, uh, the, the hair bundle should spend at least 2,000 kb per second, which you will agree is much larger than the 3 kb per second that we had just from uh, uh, time irreversibility of a single variable x. Um, I just have one slide. I can. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Then, then we can play a bit more with this and try to see how this estimate varies as we go through the state diagram of the of the hair bundle. The state diagram is shown here on the left. 
as a function of two control parameters, the calcium feedback strength S and the maximal motor force F. You see there's a region of quiescence where the bundle does not oscillate, and there's a region of oscillations uh, inside here when the parameters are, have intermediate values. Now, on the right is a, a, a plot of the entropy production rate in kb per second as a function of f max as we move from quiescent uh, into the oscillatory region. For, and there are three curves. The one that shows the, the answer, the truth, the true entropy, uh, 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 entropy produced by the system in black. In green is the estimate we would get from just measuring time reversibility or quantifying time reversibility in the position of the bundle only. And in orange, the estimate from the tour. As you can see, the estimate from the tour provides a rather good estimation of the total entropy production rate because it's only threefold lower than the answer when we are in the, uh, uh, the, the true value when we are in the oscillatory region. As we move from quiescence into oscillation, we see that all three actually estimates go up, which is good news, in particular for the, this one. So this one is, is, although it gives low bounds, it's able to detect when we cross the underlying hop application. So I think I'm done. I will just summarize what I uh, uh, told you. Uh, really a key feature of hair cells and really the, the underlying mechanism behind its mechanical sensitivity is that ion channels are coupled to elastic springs. By construction, this results in a mechanical nonlinearity because when the channels open, they produce the so-called getting forces that generates a nonlinear mechanical behavior. What is remarkable is that only 50 ion channels are open to modify, are able to modify the stiffness, and also I didn't have time, but the friction also, of an organelle that is about 10 microns in size, so only 50 ion channels, very small molecules, are able to modify the mechanical properties of an object that's 10 micron in size. These getting forces can be large enough to result in negative stiffness, which coupled, when coupled to delayed force feedback by the motors that are there to impose a sensitive operating point, result into, result into oscillations. Now, this requires energy to drive oscillations. If we analyze time reversibility of uh, x of t only, we can demonstrate activity, but the bounds we get are very small compared to the true uh, energy dissipated, uh, power dissipated by the hair bundle, which is on the order of uh, 6,000 kBT per second. Now, if you have access to two observables, which would be the current that flows through the cell and the position of the hair bundle, then we can get tighter bounds, uh, which are only threefold lower than the, the, the answer, so 2,000 uh, uh, kBT per second. Now, if you look at these numbers, they look large, but they're not that large, actually, because 6,000 kBT per second co would correspond to 300 kBT per cycle at, uh, for an oscillation of 20 hertz, or about 30 ATP idealized per cycle. This is not much. It depends on how you discuss that, that number, of course. But, you know, we know that there are at least a few hundred molecular motors per tip-link. We know that because there is about 10 piconewton tension in a single tip-link, 50 tip-links, to impose 10 piconewton tension, you need at least, you know, 5, 10 motors attached at any given time. You multiply by 50, so you have hundreds of motors. So 30 ATP per cycle is not much if you, if you divide that by the number of motors that uh, we have in a, in a hair cell. Okay. I'm done. I will thank uh, my collaborators, Edgar Juan and Frank Julischer, who actually did the job on, on this, you know, theoretical job on, on these estimations. My students, Atiteb, who did the nice electron micrographs, and Jeremy, who provided the library of uh, spontaneous oscillations, and Jim Hudspeth for the very long standing uh, collaboration and friendship, and you for your attention. Thanks very much, Pascal. Uh, so I open the room for questions from students first. <laughs> I think here, yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. So uh, this uh, 6,000 kT per second that you said, that is just the viscous dissipation uh, estimate, or how do you measure that 6,000 kT per second? So, um, so how we measure it um, is, is from the, we don't measure it, we estimate it from a model. Uh, it comes from this relation here. Mm. This relation doesn't tell you where it comes, you know, th then we can discuss where it comes from. No. Okay. Pa part, of it, part of it comes from, as you said, you know, uh, dissipation 
uh, into the fluid, you know, so how, how large will be this lambda coefficient here will determine that. Uh, but not only, not only, the, uh, 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 if we estimate how much energy is dissipated in the surrounding fluid, I would come up with a number that is a tenth, maybe, uh, it's not as large, like, uh, what was it, what was it, what? Yeah, uh, like we have 300 kbt per second, that would be too much. So some energy, I would say, uh, uh, is dissipated by the active process itself. You know, it requires energy. The, the, the active process is also dissipating energy, like the second equation is dissipating energy also. Not only, the energy doesn't go only into the fluid. And actually, we, I, th I believe we haven't thought hard enough about this part. Uh, how to, yeah. yeah. Which one? The equations, yeah. Yeah. What's the, yeah. What is the relative magnitude of those two terms? And one you, one's a kind of a motor term. You know, you know when I prepared this talk, I asked Max I precisely that question. But when we were, you know, the nose in the theory, yeah. we, 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 I, I didn't see that question. So I don't have the answer to that. Uh, but, 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 but let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Maybe Edgar knows. The second, yeah. the second is much larger because the... The F2 is a non-conservative yeah. force. So when you do cycles, it's accumulating. The first one is, is smaller in several orders of magnitude. I remember. But it's been a while, so I have to. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Actually, actually, yeah. Uh, uh, if there's a, there was an interesting result I didn't put here. You see these two equations are the different temperatures. There's a T here. It's the actual temperature. And here, there's an effective temperature that measures the activity of the motors. If the temperatures were equal, which they are not. Then we, uh, uh, um, uh, Edgar showed that this total entropy production would simply be uh, Fm times x dot, x a dot uh, divided by uh, t. So all the dissipation would be in the activity, in the second equation. So this by itself already shows that in fact most of the power you need is in the active part, not in the fluid part. Yeah. By definition, because it is stratonovic, uh, stratonovic product. So this term, you say? Yeah, it derives from a potential. It, the F1 is minus partial. Yeah. But, but <laughs> the F1 uh, depends on yeah, both F1 variables. Yeah, F1 depends on X2. They're so coupled. Yeah, depends yeah, on X1 and X2. Because the potential is not yeah, just yeah. a function of X. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not the function of X. It's the function of, of X and XA. So it's not zero. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a bit misleading, yeah. So excuse me, no, I have a question. So may I ask you about the instability of the cycle? Um, so you show that uh, the force has this negative uh, stiffness, yes. because you yeah. explained it, and already Jim also showed us these results. So my question is, if you, if you go back in the, in, the, in, the, in the stretching process, so you are pushing on the fibers, on, on the bundle, yeah. but then if you come back, you follow the same path, or there is hysteresis, in the force versus displacement curve that you measure. So it's a irreversible so, okay. uh, process or is it a reversible process? Okay, I'm glad you asked the question, okay? So first of all, the force displacement relation we measure are measured in an approximation of a steady state. So we apply steps, okay? We wait a little bit and we measure force. Ideally, you know, stiffness is defined at long times, you know, at frequency zero. Because of adaptation, we cannot exactly do it because adaptation, we always relax tension we put in the leaks. But if you put it at short times, we estimate that this, the force displacement relations we measure are steady state. They are e explained by equilibrium thermodynamics. Now, as you say, if you move... Yeah, I'm just asking the question for the experiment, not yeah, the yeah, for if the you move, or, or, or the, as the bundle oscillates, what is the force displacement relation? Okay. And, and I'm glad you asked for this because I didn't have time to add those slides in my talk. <laughs> so I will show it. Well, but they're will, important, yeah. I will show it now. <laughs> so uh, if you do something like, where is it? Uh, if you do something like this. So you don't apply a step. You apply a continuous movement to the base of the fiber. Okay, you move it back and forth. Now the channels are brought out of equilibrium. Okay, because they don't have, to, they, 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 it's continuously on the move. In that case, this is what we measure. Okay. Okay? In that case, this is what we measure. So the force displacement relation now shows hysteresis. 
and your shape of this curve, this is, is interesting in itself, okay? If we cut the channels, if we cut the, uh, the tiplings, this is what we measure. If we dis cut the tiplings, so we disconnect the channels from the bundle, we get hysteresis. This is expected because we are moving the bundle in the fluid, so there should be hysteresis. And actually, the simple shape of that curve means that we can model the bundle simply as a spring with a dash pot. So the, the width of this hysteresis will tell us how much viscous drag there is in the bundle. And when we do measure this, we find something on the order of 100 nanometers second per meter. That's how we get our parameters from the model. So how much is the dissipated work in this area? OK. OK. Uh, so the, uh, it's a few hundred kBT, few hundred kBT per second. Okay. okay, so one tenth of the total thing okay. we measured actively. And you see, you see here that the channels, when they're connected, they contribute to friction. You see a bubble in the center, which means that as channels pop open and close, we know they pop open and close because you see the, stiff, the, the, the slope here is decreasing here, which means that channels open here. Then they open as we come back. Oops. As we come back, they open, we come back, and they close here, so you're getting compliance. So we can tell the channels open and close in this region. But associated to that, there's an increased friction. And we can, if, since I have a second talk, uh, if, if we block the channels using a drug, we get rid both of the nonlinear stiffness and of the added friction coming from opening and closing of the channels, which are brought out of equilibrium if we move continu continuously. So I want to make a further comment. When you exp in, exper in your experiments, you control the position of the glass fiber, yes. and you move it, either ramping or by stepwise manner, as you said. If you were to control the force rather than the position of the optical fiber, then you would naturally find these theresis because uh, in force uh, yeah, it's yeah. not the same as in position. Sure, sure. Have you considered this also? Yeah, no, sure, sure. And, and um, uh, you, you're right. If we, if, we, if we did, and actually I didn't have time to go into the specifics, of course, but when we measure this S-shaped curve, Okay. We measure them on the displacement clamp condition. I didn't say that. Okay. There's actually feedback between the position of the base and the motion at the tip. That's how we are able to measure those points. Without any feedback, you can never measure those points. And as you said correctly, if we were on the force clamp condition, we would get something where we would jump here. And as we move back, we would jump there and we would see hysteresis. Okay. You're correct. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. There was a question here. Yeah, no? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, did you try to apply the Harada Sasa relation to estimate the entropy production from the, from the violation of the fluctuation dissipation theorem since you have uh, access to both the response and correlation function? Um, I'm not sure I know precisely what uh, the relation uh, is. I've heard about it many times because I share the, the, the office with Jacques Poe, and he tells me a lot about this. But, uh, <laughs> What we try to do, uh, I don't know if it's related, but uh, what we try to do is to uh, try to uh, see whether we could um, apply a generalized fluctuation uh, theorem to this kind of system. Um, and we could. Uh, I don't know if it's related. But uh, so fluctuation dissipation is violated. Uh, but because, in fact, here we're close to our hypothecation, if we change variables so that we're now in a rotating frame, uh, we go around the limit cycle, then we can restore a relation between fluctuation and dissipation. I guess it's related to what you say, but not precisely what you say. Um, Moreover, there is a paper by them, by Florian and Jim, where they applied the recent, it's a recent paper, so yeah, you okay. can also <laughs> ask them in the coffee break. Yes. So, so very nice talk, and uh, it's really interesting. Uh, I have uh, two questions. The, the first one is related to the, uh, when you use one variable, you get 3 kV, and then you have two variables, you get like 3,000. Yeah. Uh, can we understand this way? Like, uh, if you coarse grain, I mean, like, like if you have many, many dimensions, you coarse grain, and then typically the entropy production will be reduced. Yeah. So, so, so that's sort yeah, of it's like not, yeah, it's not, grain. That way, it's not a surprise. Yeah, yeah I agree with yeah, you. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It's not a surprise. If, yeah. you, if you have little information, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you will get uh, small estimates. If you have more information, you will get tighter, bigger estimates. This is yeah. no, the, 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 the yeah. question is, you know, how much, yeah, yeah. how low is low? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and three is not so far from zero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, if you only have two, ver uh, two states, and then, then it's, 
There's no and, and, uh, uh, the, the, thing, the, the yeah. thing is that, yeah, if we, if we are able yeah. to measure both the current and the yeah. position, yeah. we'll we get almost all of it. That's the, that's the prediction. Yeah. yeah, the other thing is related. Uh, you, you keep on saying uh, the violation of uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem. I mean, one could understand the other way that you can generalize the fluctuation dissipation theorem so you have an extra component rather than you know, force the response equal to the fluctuation. No, no it's, right? it's again going, yeah. I agree with you, yeah. uh, going along the same line. If you have only limited information, yeah. then of course we violate the relations between the fluctuations and, uh, uh, and, and the response just because you, you don't know what you're doing. The stem is driving from inside, and if you had access to this driving form from inside, then all of a sudden you could restore a relation, and I guess that's the, the idea. If you have access to more degrees of freedom, if you have access to all out of equilibrium degrees of freedom, then in principle you can restore so, so in principle, one could measure the fluctuations and the response and p perhaps some current yeah. so that you yeah. can establish So that's, that's the idea. I'm, I've been trying to convince a PhD student to do exactly that for many years. Okay. But these are difficult experiments. So, so if we're able to measure you know, the current that flows into the cell as well as the deflection, we can have a two by two matrix of responses and fluctuations yep. and then play with it to see whether they're related. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so last question. Okay. Thanks for the beautiful talk. Um, a very fast two questions. The first one is, what is TF in the model? I, I wonder if it is the same effective temperature that you uh, ah. discussed about uh, the violation. No, no, it's not at all. It's okay. the same notation. I should be careful in my talk. It's not at all the same. So it's a fitting parameter. No, no, it's, a, it's a, so it comes from um, estimating, you know, if you have um, uh, motors, when they attach, they produce a force but they have a certain probability to attach and detach. You know, you know what motor, molecular motors are? They're, no? Yes, no? Yes, yes. Yes, so they are links that attach and detach, and then when they attach, they produce a force. So if you estimate the variance of that force, which would be like something like F squared, you know, the magnitude of the force squared, P1 minus P, and exponential minus T over tau, where tau is the mean time they stay attached, uh, and, and you look at the low frequency limit of that, okay. then you can map that, you can calculate what would be the corresponding temperature Okay. associated with this variance. So this so is this higher is than the, the thermal... Uh, and it's higher. It's yeah. not much higher, actually. We find it's 1.5 T. Okay. Not much higher. <clears throat> okay, the second question is, uh, what about the interactions between hair bundles? I mean, you have, yes. you have so, shown a forest of... Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, in the absence of the, of the overlying membrane, um, they are too far apart to be coupled uh, aerodynamically at least with the bundles we're using in the frog. It's not the case in some other species like lizards where they have long bundles, they're close to one another, so if one moves, the other will know because the fluid, there will be fluid coupling. In our case, we don't think there's fluid coupling. However, they are coupled because there's an elastic membrane on top. So if one is, is oscillating, the neighbors will know. And actually, uh, I, I strongly believe that coupling is very important for the normal operation of, uh, of an auditory organ. And the reason why I believe that is that if you take a single hair bundle, the number of elements in the single hair bundle is, is low, 50 channels. So in fact, uh, uh, although there's activity, the maximal gain you can get with a single cell is rather limited because of the intrinsic inherent noise there is in the system. So there are signatures of hot perfication, but there's no hot perfication uh, with a single object. Okay? It's a concept that you can get if you have an infinite number of objects, like in thermodynamics. Um, so, because of noise, you destroy the hubification and you have limited amplification. However, if you couple several cells together, then you can get noise averaging between the cells due to the coupling, and you can increase the gain. And we had actually published work on this, showing that if you couple a noisy hair bundle to similar neighbors, uh, then the gain of the response is increasing. So, coupling is very important, yes. Okay, so let's thank Pascal again. And it's time for coffee break, which is just behind here.